uh, we're going to get started. Um, grab a drink, a little snack. Warm day today in the city. So thank you for coming. Are we on uh, Facebook Live? All right. Hello, Facebook. Um, it's great to see everybody here. We're going to have a, a really interesting session today. This is the, uh, the first of many that we'll be doing as part of the, uh, the digital experience and innovation capability. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Davis. I'm the head of digital for Ogilvy in the US. And uh, today we're gonna talk about a paper that just dropped literally four hours ago called The Seven Lessons from Established Online Video Viewers. And this is a partnership we've been working on for about a year since we started this uh, with the team at the Young Turks. So uh, who, who's familiar with the Young Turks? I think we had a lot of fans in the audience. <laughs> so, you know, number one news creators on, on YouTube. Uh, we're going to talk to uh, their founder, uh, Cenk Uger, in a little while, along with their president, Deanna Brown, about all the things that they're doing. The, the TYT is an interesting story in that they started in the pre-YouTube era and really uh, it came, into, uh, came onto their own during the YouTube era and is now a, a, a suite of networks that are branching out across a number of different platforms. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but that actually plays into why they were the perfect partners for this. So let's start. Where did we start? We started with an observation that we couldn't ignore. Online video viewing is a mature activity. What, a lot of what we read about in the trades is still kind of like, oh, how many people are moving to online video? What's the newest thing? And we thought, well, you know what? It, YouTube itself is over a decade old. Online video has been around for a while. Not everybody is interacting with it like a newbie. Somebody somewhere must be sitting down and using this in the way that an experienced user would. And, and what we thought was, and it's a little small to read here, but it, we wanted to kind of see if there was a myth to bust because everything that we heard and read about was about constant transformation, right? And, and prognostication about what's next, what's coming next, what's the next thing in the market, what's the next, 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 next. Yet all the clients that I work with only really care about now, right? We're not making an advertisement for 2025. We're making an advertisement for the second quarter, the third quarter of this year. So as we start to think about that, what are the things that we can learn that tell us more about how to be successful in the moment rather than worrying about all the time what's coming next. So what we set out to do, we wanted to dig deep into the habits of experienced online video viewers. Experienced is the key. This is not a study about newbies. This is a study about people who have already embraced the medium. We wanted to partner with creators who have a large established audience, hence the Young Turks, which has an amazing audience, uh, not just in size, but in energy and vigor. We knew they would be the perfect partners for us to work with on this. Um, and in fact, 2,400, over 2,400 members of the TYT audience responded to our series of questions about their online viewing behavior. And that's where the bulk of the data that we're gonna look at today comes from. And, and I want to stress, too, that we asked about general behaviors across content platforms, different kinds of content, different platforms, with the exclusion of Netflix, Amazon Prime, and the other OTT services. So this is more about YouTube, Facebook, and, and what I consider to be traditional online video. It's not about the movie services or the, uh, the original programmers. After doing this, there were seven things that rose to the top of the, uh, of the research, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So number one, yes, the future of TV is bleak. This one hurts me a little bit because I'm not a TV is dead guy. I actually think from a content point of view, TV is probably in its golden era and it's never been better. But what we consider TV in the industry, what people consider TV at home, it's changing a little bit. So what we found was that eight out of 10 of our respondents expect that digital will be their sole source for programming within the next three years. So that's not necessarily saying they don't need a TV set, but they don't need a cord. And we've heard a lot about cord cutting. We've heard a lot about this being a youth movement. Our studies show that we might have to go back and question that a little bit. Three and four seniors and boomers told us they believe online streaming and SVOD will be their exclusive delivery method in a few years. So that's not a, a Gen Xer who, who's a cord cutter. That's not a millennial who's a cord never. That's an adult saying, yeah, you know what? This online thing is actually getting to the point where I can use it as my main source of entertainment. I love this one. Eight out of 10 seniors already think the TV as a device is irrelevant. 
So that, that to me was one of the most shocking findings that we came up with, because I, I really did not expect to see that alternate devices would be that prevalent across the age groups. So you know, what does this tell us? Um, the people who have jumped to online video remain bullish. Uh, they're not looking to go back. They're looking to increase their activities with online video. Um, and if traditional TV doesn't position itself to win those people back, its only future is one of decline. So again, not the programming, not the idea that people are going to watch video, but our idea of traditional TV and how it gets delivered to the customer is changing. And you know, even the, uh, the notion that it was a draw, even the idea that online video is just as good as TV, is still gonna be a crushing blow to TV. So what does that mean in terms of the audience that we're looking at, and what are the kinds of things that they're doing? One of our hypotheses going in was that session viewing, what we're calling session viewing, uh, is a, a predominant trend, yet one that we're not seeing written about a lot. So what is a session view? We're talking about the continuous engagement of a viewer over long periods of time. It's unstructured. So in that 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours, a person could watch five videos on YouTube, jump to Facebook, go to a website, come back to YouTube, go back to Facebook, multiple creators. It is absolutely unstructured. But the idea is that their attention is focused on online video as their entertainment source or their news source or whatever source they're using it for, for a continuous amount of time. So 68% of our respondents reported that their sessions last more than 30 minutes. 40% report averages over an hour. So when you think about how we, we approach video sometimes, and we think about, especially from a marketing point of view, I'm gonna make a pre-roll ad, and I'm gonna run it against the video, and somebody's gonna watch the video and see the pre-roll ad and then go on their merry way. Actually, that pre-roll ad may seem like a mid-roll to them because they're 48 minutes into a viewing session when your ad happens to show up, right? So when, when we think about this and the amount of this viewing that's going on, it starts to make us think that we have to change our, our mindset a little bit. 73% of the respondents say that their 30-minute sessions happen more than three days a week. I love this one. Almost 30% say they watch for an hour or more per session daily. That's a lot of video consumption. So what does that tell us? Uh, it tells us a couple of things. One, we have to address that session viewing is good for the creators, advertisers, and platforms. The more people view, the longer they view for, the more eyeballs we have on ads, the more eyeballs we have for creators, and the better the platforms are doing. So session viewing overall is a very good thing. And what we should think about is how we actually uh, engage better in sessioning so that we're increasing the length of these views. Um, but the data suggests that there's a disconnect, again, about how consumers watch video and how we present advertising. And we're gonna dive into this a little bit more. But um, you know, we just generally don't have conversations about what is our ad going to be like for somebody who's already been watching online video for 45 minutes straight. And then we have to understand, uh, with that, understand how it impacts advertising creative. So do we have a different approach to creative if we know that it's likely to fall in the middle of one of these one or two hour sessions, rather than being the first thing somebody sees when they sit down to engage with video. So sessioning, who's doing it? Um, I would have guessed, actually I did guess before we started this, that we were gonna find out that it was a young demographic doing it during the day. I was thinking of college kids and uh, recent grads who maybe are not employed yet, hanging out and watching hours and hours and hours of sci-fi videos, not true. Yes, three quarters of millennials report that their session times are over 30 minutes, but Gen X reports 70% of them do sessions over 30 minutes. Boomers, 64 are sessioning over 30 minutes at a time, and seniors, 53%. This really shocked us. I have yet to see a report that said that seniors are a viable audience for online video advertising, yet here they are, not just watching videos, not just tuning in to watch a video of their grandchild on Facebook, which is the, the uh, a horrendous example that we always hear for seniors' behavior, but they're actually doing what the rest of the world is doing. And they're doing it a lot. Over half of those people are sessioning more than three days a week. So this is not a one-off. This is not, they were recommended something and it did it once and forgot about it. It's habit. So with that, 
you know, is this a time that we have to start considering how we're creating ads and start thinking about the broader demographic range? We're not just reaching millennials when we're talking about online video. So number four, this one really shocked us. Sessioning is a prime time activity. So again, I thought that we were gonna be talking about younger people who were doing this during the daytime. Wrong. 50% of these sessions happen during TV's prime time hours. 29 of them happen during late night. That's killer. If you're, if you're in TV, that's, that's a very bad sign. Only a third of the views of these session views are happening in the morning and afternoon. The rest of them are happening during the most valuable time the TV has. And what we're seeing is of these viewers, it's a draw in terms of their preference for advertising on TV or online video. They're happy or not happy equally across both platforms. So what we have here is an audience that's not just larger, older doing these longer sessions than maybe we had thought, but they're actually doing it during the time of day that the TV networks need them the most. So the impact from that, there's some very obvious things, obviously. Uh, the time spent is competing directly with the most valuable time slots. Um, the viewers are clearly seeing online video as an alternative TV, but I think we still in the marketing industry think of online video as an ancillary platform, right? I've never heard anybody say, I'm gonna make my YouTube ad and then repurpose it for TV, right? We don't think that way, but what if that's the way our audience is thinking? What if they're sitting down and saying, we don't care where we're getting it from, what the ads are from, we're gonna do it at the time of day we wanna do it, and all of a sudden TV is losing viewers. So there seems to be a strong case to be made, at least to start to be made, that we should be equally valuing online video and TV in the marketplace in certain situations. And certainly session viewing in prime time is one of those. If a TV network had somebody watching two hours of video straight of their network from eight to 10, they'd be thrilled. So why isn't the audience doing that online valued the same? Oh, this one, this is a difficult one. Um, and this was actually one of the genesis of this, uh, of this whole study. Uh, and it started with us looking at skippable and unskippable ads, right? So I love skippable ads because they give the control to the user. Unskippables are fine, but if you don't get 100% completion rate on your unskippable, what does that mean? It means the user abandoned the view. They didn't just abandon your ad because they can't skip it. They actually stopped their session. They stopped viewing video entirely because they didn't want to sit through an ad, right? So what did they tell us about this behavior? 27% um, report doing this, that they'll end the session entirely because they don't want to watch a non-skippable. It's out of context, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this says a couple of different things, right? It says maybe skippables are, should be our sole focus, or at least the majority of our focus. But I think it also has to make us think in terms of messaging, in terms of creative, what are we doing if we put an ad in front of people that makes them end their entire viewing session? Um, irrelevant content, non-skippable formats, and poor contextual placement were all listed as things that contributed to having an ad end a viewing session. We're gonna talk a little bit more about context in a minute and what exactly that means to this audience. Uh, and you know, as I said, incomplete, non-skippable views are a sign of session killing. Session killing is bad for all of us. Nobody wants to be the person who has the ad that kills the session. The creator certainly doesn't want the session to be killed because they want to have continuous viewing. And the platform wants the user to keep going. So it's in everybody's best interest that we look at how we can do things that increase the value of the session view, that increase the length of the session view, and actually make the advertising experience something inclusive in it, rather than something that disrupts it sometimes to a, uh, to, to a very detrimental end. So number six, relevance and context are allies. This was the stat that I knew we were gonna find at some point, but six out of 10 viewers would prefer no advertising. Right? That's not a shock. <laughs> and certainly there are ways, right, with YouTube Red and, and other subscription services that they can have that experience. But when they do have to see advertising, when they do have to deal with it, 92% say they don't pay attention to it. Right? So neither of these things are very good. 
for us as a whole. They're not good for anything, anyone in the business, but there are formats they like. So amongst this negativity of, I would rather not have an ad, I'm not really interested in an ad, the truth is there are things that the audiences are very interested in, it's just that they're not seeing them enough. So 60% prefer a shorter ad, um, and ads spread over a session. So this is something we've been talking about um, with a couple of the platforms. Uh, it's available, uh, it's kind of available right now with Facebook. Uh, it's gonna be coming to the, uh, the other major platforms where we can say we're going to run six second spots instead of 30 second spots, but we can say our 30 is gonna be divided into five, six, five, six second spots that run in order. So over the course of 10 minutes of a session view, the user might see our 30, but they're seeing it in five individual six second chunks. That seems to be something that the audience is asking for. Um, but then again, Half of them prefer one longer ad, just get it over with, right? So you can't please anybody, everybody, but what we're seeing, um, not from this study, but from other studies in, in the uh, last three or four months, is that the shorter ad number is going up, the longer ad number is going down. 40% are more likely to sit through a non-skippable if it's short. So this is interesting now. If we want to do non-skippables, sixes are less likely to end a viewing session than a longer ad. So there's something to be said, I think, for the, uh, the six second unit. Um, half of our folks were frustrated with ads being out of context. And this one I thought was really interesting because I, I think of context in different ways when we're talking about videos. 65% um, like ads targeting their personal interests, but they don't really like retargeting. They don't wanna see the ad for the sandals they were shopping for a day before. They want an ad that's predictive, something that extends on their behavior, something that maybe they'll learn from, something they didn't think about. So instead of hitting them with what they've done, hit them with what they haven't thought about. It's a really interesting angle for machine learning in terms of uh, how, we, how we message and how we reach viewers. Three and four, like ads related to the videos currently being viewed. This is a really interesting stat. So if I'm watching motocross videos, I'm more likely to pay attention to an ad if it's about motocross. So as we start looking at variations of ads and, and using dynamic techniques so that we can version ads in any number of different ways, is this something we should start thinking about now, where we're actually creating versions of ads that fit with the content that's being viewed rather than try to target it all against the personality, against the persona of the user. 57% report paying attention if the video's talent is in the advertising. So if you're watching somebody like the Young Turks or you're watching Sexy Phil or any other creator that you like, you will tend to pay more attention if those ads feature those creators, right? So it's getting back to the old days of TV when the ads and the shows were put together by the same people, right? It's that, it's that inclusiveness rather than disruptiveness that the audience seems to be looking for. And our last one, this one is, is gonna be a little bit controversial, I think. Save your emotion and your URL. So no surprise, almost everybody told us that online video ads should be entertaining. But what do they want? What does that mean? What is entertaining? So most, or the most popular, is humor. Again, not really a surprise. I think most of us could have guessed that. Uh, number two is just interesting content. They want something that will engage them ads that are relatable. Again, so maybe you know something I should say, relevance, recall of relevance, not relevance. Sorry about that. <laughs> Less than a third say that visual appeal is important to them. We thought that was an interesting one, but here are the two kickers. Less than 11% want emotional content. They're not looking to have their heartstrings pulled. They're not looking for that kind of experience when they're in a session. They're viewing a lot of content, hour, half hour, two hours of content. They're not looking for emotion. And this one is tricky. The same amount don't want to engage. They just want to watch. And when you think about it, that makes sense. If I'm sitting down for a two hour session and I'm only a half hour into it, I'm probably not gonna click on a link in an ad that's gonna take me out of my session. 
So are there different ways that we have to start creating the ads to account for when people are likely to be sessioning versus when they're not? And that gets into a lot of the, uh, the tracking that the platforms are just starting to be able to develop where we can understand if we're delivering the ad to somebody who's just starting their view versus somebody who's been in a longer view. Unfortunately, it's very hard to track those longer sessions across platforms, but at least within platform, we can do it. So saving a URL obviously is, if you put your URL at the end and something to click, these viewers are not likely to click on it. So then the CTA shouldn't be one of your main KPIs if you're trying to reach these kinds of viewers. So these are our seven in a recap. Future TV is bleak in terms of tradition. Session viewing is becoming the dominant behavior of established video viewers. They're not watching one-off videos. They're watching for many minutes at a time. Uh, it's not just young people who are doing this. Uh, we've seen the take up of it across all age groups of the audience that we've polled. Um, sessioning is happening during prime time. So again, it, it's happening when the TV networks are most interested in having those eyeballs on TV content. Bad advertising is becoming an issue for killing off sessions. So we have to start thinking about how do we work better within the, uh, the context of sessions. Uh, relevance and context, allies. I think that's, it's really interesting to me. I think the context piece and that, that stat around not wanting to be retargeted, but rather having predictive ads or ads that are related to the content. And uh, certainly ads related to the content is something that we can be uh, taking advantage of now. And then the idea that they're not really looking for emotional content out of the ads. They're not looking to click. They're looking for something that's relevant, something that's humorous, something that's informational to them, but something that's not going to disrupt their entire session. So I'm very happy to say that to talk about this, and we're gonna do a little Q&A later on, we have two excellent guests we're guaranteed to tell us what it all means. <laughs> we have Cenk Uger, who is the founder of the Young Turks, and we have Deanna Brown, who is president of TYT Networks. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, 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 good to see you. Oh, what a day in the city today, huh? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I was coming in from Brooklyn and apparently one of the tunnels or bridges were jammed. I get into the Uber, it says, you'll arrive at 3.30. And then by the time I realized I wasn't gonna arrive, it said 4.40. <laughs> and they say LA traffic is bad. Uh, so luckily I grew up around here, so I hopped off the car and went into the subway and got here, so. so awesome. Both the downside and the upside of New York, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making the effort. <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a, uh, quite a week. So um, super psyched that we have the study out, you know, just dropped uh, this afternoon, something we've been working on for quite a while. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, the, the, uh, back when we first talked about this was the idea of why the TYT audience would be a good proxy for this kind of report. Can you talk to us a little bit about who they are and kind of how you've nurtured the growth of them over the years? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's the connected generation, so it does range in age, age a little bit, as Rob found out through, through the study. But yes, predominantly still younger. 18 to 34 is 70% of the audience. Uh, now, when you compare, compare that to, for example, cable news, uh, it is a stunning difference. So the average age of the CNN viewer is 61. Uh, MSNBC is 64. Fox News is 68. Uh, O'Reilly, when he was on, was 72. So every 42-year-old required a 102-year-old <laughs> <laughs> to balance out. Uh, and and uh, I love our older viewers, et cetera, but yes, the heart of it is 18 to 34. And, uh, and we are predominantly male. And more, but you know, so that's the demographics. But um, I guess you could say psychographic of the, and the culture of the uh, audience is one that's super open, independent, uh, and is soaking in information and is seeking out information because we did not come prepackaged. So I was on MSNBC and I followed Chris Matthews. So all I had to do was one person better than Chris Matthews, and I was a star, <laughs> right? You get handed a lead-in in television. And so that's a giant infrastructure. 
Whereas uh, online, you have to build your audience from scratch, from nothing. There's no lead in at all. Although now, to be fair, on Mondays, my lead in is Dan Rather. <laughs> so <laughs> Not a bad lead in. <laughs> that's right. He's, yeah. he's part of our network signed recently, and he does the show before me on Monday. That's not something I would have imagined. Um, but, um, but overall, it's people who found us and who have an affinity towards us and hence are deeply, deeply engaged. And I think it was interesting, if, if I'm remembering all the data correct, uh, you know, our only restriction on who we polled was that they were over 18. But in terms of the respondents, the mix between men and women was pretty even. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting that, you know, the, the, the TYT audience, it seems like they're very willing to tell you what they're thinking and, and communicate how they're, how they're using the product. And I yeah. think that helped the study a lot. Gee, I wonder where they got that from. Yeah, Rob, and if I can, <laughs> one of the things I'll add, and I think Jenk is obviously very much aware of this because it was part of the uh, ethos of the promise of the channel or the opportunity was this idea that it was really a two-way conversation. You know, we talk a lot about interactivity in this business, but when reality is, this is a guy in the middle of the show that'll pull his phone out and look down to see what someone's tweeting and actually bring that to bear as part of the conversation. So that's a way of telling the audience that you care what they think and as a result, they respond. So we put them first and they respond back accordingly. So this, when I came to the company just three, four months ago, that was one of the most phenomenal attributes is that this audience is that dynamic. And this is connected, but they're, they're connected to each other and their communities, but they're also connected to us as a, as a media entity. So for me, that connectedness actually goes from us to them and then back. And so that, that notion, his, one of his more infamous lines is, I'm not the Young Turks, you're the Young Turks. And he, it repeatedly comes up because that, he's not only is he getting older, and I would say he's no longer a Young Turk, but uh, truth telling. Uh, but <laughs> the, the reality is this idea that the audience is is very much a part of the conversation as the hosts are. So, quick fun fact: uh, when I read the tweets uh, or YouTube super chat or whatever, however we're receiving the message, uh, if you can literally make us LOL, you get a free T-shirt from our shop. <laughs> so, if anyone in the studio laughs from the tweet that I read. Boom, shoptyt.com, you get a free t-shirt. Plus, it's a nice plug for shoptyt.com. <laughs> <laughs> Always thank you. So, so one of the things that, that uh, struck us as we were looking at the report and, and, and thinking to how the, uh, the users do engage with you, a lot of that engagement, the satisfaction comes from watching you in real time, not watching a, uh, a time-shifted version of the programming, right? So we saw the data that said that so much viewing of not just your content, but content in general is happening during prime time. What are you seeing about that? How is, how is the, uh, the appointment view doing in terms of, uh, of your content? So uh, a long time ago, we had an internal debate at the company when it was much smaller about when we should have the live show. And at the time, uh, noon was a lot of heavy listening uh, to the internet and some viewing, but there wasn't a lot of viewing happening back then. Uh, so in the middle of the day, as you would have suspected, uh, and I said, no, let, let's put it at night. I, I think that this is a two hour program and not everybody watches it as a two hour program, but for people who are watching live, they're going to need time. They're just, I mean, I know a lot of people tell me in the streets that they listen to us while working. Okay. <laughs> Good, I guess. <laughs> um, but, uh, but overall, I thought if we put it uh, six to 8 PM Eastern, that it, we would be better served. And it looks like that that has borne out, uh, that, that prime time, even, in fact, we should have put it a little later. Um, and, and when we did election night coverage, it stretched into prime time. And at the time we broke the internet record, we had a million hours of viewing in one day in that day. Mm. Mm. Was that all on YouTube? No, it was, uh, we uh, triple stream there. We were mm. the first ever to triple stream uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And what, how's it going in terms of your platform expansion? I know one of the, you, you started pre-YouTube days, correct? Mm -hmm. And then yep. I know went through YouTube, the app, Facebook, what kinds of things are you looking at in order to increase the uh, visibility of the networks? How much can we say? As much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> Do we get a scoop right here? <laughs> so let's put it this way. We are very seriously looking at the OTTs and the skinny bundles. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and, and they are very seriously looking back at us. Um, <laughs> so hold, hold for announcements. But um, so he, here's our view of the platform. So we're platform agnostic. Uh, it, of course we care which one is performing better and historically YouTube has performed way better. Uh, not just because uh, it, it's where we started and it had a lead in terms of video. Facebook obviously came much, much later. Uh, but because it provides much longer watch times uh, and, and more and deeper engagement. So, and, and by the way, more money. So that also <laughs> matters. Um, now, having said that, we have a huge audience on Facebook. It doesn't monetize as well, but it is huge. Uh, and then we've got Hulu, Roku, Pluto. We're, we're on all those. Then you got the OTTs coming up. We just launched our app a couple of days ago. And so the idea is huge top of the funnel. Uh, and then you get more and more engagement as you go down the funnel. So as you're, as you're thinking about those different platforms, and, and this is especially relevant to the audience here, are you thinking about different ways to advertise across them? You've been trying uh, different kinds of formats. I know that you've, you've done some where you've had TYT talent in the ads. That was something that we saw that popped in the, uh, in the survey. What are, you, what are you seeing in terms of, are there trends that you're identifying and what you're being asked to do? Well, Deanna knows this a lot better. Let, let me just give you the historical context. Uh, yeah, we, we put our uh, hosts in the ads and I thought, I, I didn't have fancy studies to back it up, but I do now, <laughs> which I feel great about. But it was intuitive that, um, that they came to watch us. So if we're in the ad, they're far, far more likely to watch it. So we did a country roll ad where I played some sort of cartoon monster or something. Uh, and then our other anchors were the reporters. It was just a ton of fun and everybody got that it was tongue in cheek. Uh, I did an ad for Squarespace where uh, I built my own website, which was considered near miraculous because the audience is aware that I suck at tech. Uh, even though we have the longest running uh, show on the internet, I could barely turn on a computer. And the tagline was so simple, even Jen can do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what um, coming into the, the opportunity to roll here was really about what is the most effective means of sort of messaging for brands. And this, um, I sort of established this notion, or we've established this notion of native advertising being one of the most contextually relevant in session viewing. So it was very complimentary to what we saw in the study that we were getting feedback that, that the host could do what we call the live read, that there could be the infamous coffee cup on the desk, that we could really bring brands into the conversation in a meaningful way, and that we could ultimately deliver um, you know, non-skippable non and presence for brands throughout the broadcast and throughout ultimately all the different brands in the shows and properties. So throughout the network, but also on the flagship show. The other part that we feel very strongly about beyond the native is just the opportunity to sort of amplify or activate. So what we mean by that is to take this opportunity that appears on the show and then extend it into all of our 30 plus channels. So we really can immediately get to scale very quickly. And then lastly, of course, we have a great partnership with Facebook and with YouTube and Twitter and, and such. We can package directly that inventory and really actually give you a very efficient and effective media buy by owning share of voice and that type of thing. So early days for us in terms of native plus media just media, just native, but it's really, we're, we're in business now to sort of really partner with brands. Um, and it's an exciting time to be very much uh, in this business. And, and I would just add to that, in new media, um, let, let the, the creators play around with your product. I know that it's sometimes a little hard to let go, uh, but so we have Aspiration Bank as a sponsor and they have the mug that Deanna's referring to. I asked for a mug, I said, what are you guys doing? You're a spot, I need a mug. Right, and then the mug was too light, so I kept talking about how the you could barely read aspiration on it. Why? Because it constantly focuses people on aspiration. Like it gets them trying to read it. It gets them. It seems like I'm criticizing them, but I'm not. It's all playful, so that everybody can focus in on aspiration. And uh, finally, one night, I kept doing it over and over again, totally tongue in cheek, but having fun with it. Uh, and tweets started rolling in. And the first guy said, fine, Jenk, you broke me. I'm signing up for an Aspiration account. The second guy re responds to that tweet, 
it was the mug. <laughs> <laughs> and then a whole bunch of them. So when, when, when brands like Aspiration come to you, and, and you, know, you know the different things about relevance and what works and what doesn't work with your audience, do you find that the, the media agencies are bringing you the ideas, or are you, and do you end up in a position where you're kind of educating and it's more of a collaboration? Well, historically, it's been largely our, uh, us pushing it because mm -hmm. we just have, we know our audience, right? And we know how to connect to that audience and we know what's going to work and what's not going to work and what's going to seem authentic and what's going to seem fake and is not going to resonate with them. Uh, but I mean, if the folks have good ideas, we're super receptive to it. I think it's just a tiny bit of uh, give and take mm -hmm. so that we can craft it uh, so that that message is better delivered to that specific audience. And, and in terms of specific audiences, and Deanna, this might be more of a question for you. You mentioned the, uh, the whole suite of networks mm -hmm. that you have. So what are, the, uh, what are the different verticals that you see being interested in the different channels? I don't know if everyone, I'm sure everyone knows the main channel and knows TYT for News, that there's, a, what, 30 uh, channels? We're, we're actually on 30 platforms, and we have um, 12, we'll, call them, platforms. we'll okay. call them brands or, or, or channels, right? So we have some of the more popular ones are, um, what the Flick, Pop Trigger, Think Tank, TYT Sports, TYT Politics, TYT Interviews, TYT Investigates. There's a number of properties. We have a whole new slate of shows coming out in the next quarter. Damage Report, The Happiest Half Hour is a great show. I can't wait for you guys to see and preview that. Um, you know, No Filter, Damage Report. So really bringing more, more voices, independent voices to the network. Um, 30 Minutes. Uh, live to tape in many cases, some live events, and then of course the stalwart, which is the, the flagship, the Young Turks. So we, I like to sort of broaden the, the sort of positioning for the network at large to talk news and entertainment, because we are of course centered and focused primarily on the flagship around news and politics. But what I find as inspiring and as interesting and engaging is Nerd alert, talking, cartoons, gadgets, technology, Comic-Con, to what the flick, what's happening at the box office, ultimately what's the next fan, big presence in television and film, pop trigger, think tank, talking about women's issues, but pop culture at large. So there's a lot of really exciting things. We released, um, in our originals area, we released a, a fantastic series uh, in partnership with Go90 and the Huffington Post called True North. And it was climate control through the lens of our talent going to the North Pole. And it's just, it's a beautiful, picturesque, but really inspiring kind of view on climate. And uh, so that's the kind of exciting things. And we're in constantly in partnerships and discussions with other networks about telling and connecting with this audience on, on their platforms, all of which have sponsorship opportunities. Couple of quick notes on that. Uh, one, I ran into Ivana from Verizon Go 90 last night, and she says we're doing better than almost anything else on the platform. So, that's, awesome. uh, that's great. Uh, and then I uh, talked to some of the YouTube execs. They're doing the broadcast tonight, and create. They've been doing the Creator Summit the last two days for the top 100 creators. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying. I mean, I do have a wristband. Uh, uh, so. Uh, and I told them that we're going to have a late night show soon. And they're like, we got to get all the other top creators on your show. Uh, so there's this nice um, ecosystem now forming around that. And our most successful franchise is not on a flagship show. It's actually uh, our Game of Thrones reviews on What the Flick. So uh, different things pop in different channels. And that one has had huge resonance. So, you know, as the, all of those things wrapped up, tell the story of a, uh, of a very mature uh, company in terms of production, in terms of planning. I think there's, you know, there's still a, a sense I get in the marketplace that a lot of people associate online creators with teens in their bedrooms giving advice. You've, you've built a, uh, a full production studio in LA, correct? Can we talk a little bit yep. about that? Like how, how, it's, how the company has matured from the very first days when you were actually at home, right? That's yeah, how you that's began. Right. Yeah. So first of all, let's acknowledge that no one, no one wants to see me in my bedroom. Uh, so we're not going to do that. Um, but in, in all seriousness, when we started, uh, we were first a radio show before we were an online video show. And we started in my uh, living room in my one bedroom apartment in Sunset. And we would have celebrity guests come in 
uh, and they'd be like, this is your living room. Weird. <laughs> and, but they, they survived, uh, although they were worried at whether they were going to. Um, and then we moved into a tiny little radio. It wasn't a radio office. It was a tiny little office that we turned into a radio uh, control room, basically. Uh, and then a slightly larger one when we went to video. And I remember, so in 2010, I get on MSNBC. 2011, I get off of MSNBC and I'm about to go on current TV. So all the current executives come uh, to see our studio. And they look around and they're like, this is the legendary Young Turks. They're like, this, you guys, this is, you don't even have high ceilings. You don't even have lights, right? <laughs> and we, because we really didn't know what we were doing. And so they're like, no, no, we're going to build you a real studio. So they built us a studio where we did the TV show and the online show. And, and now we have our own, uh, which by the way, our audience paid for. Uh, when we left Current TV, we said, guys, can you give us $250,000 to build a studio? They're like, no problem. They gave us $425,000. Um, and then uh, after the Trump election, we asked for an investigative reporting team and they gave us $2 million. Uh, free. They just gave it to us. Um, and that's why, because they trust us. And we built that trust with them over all these years. And, and we did the, the old fashioned way, you know, one viewer at a time. So now, yes, I was on uh, Comedy Central last night on Jordan Klepper's show, The Opposition. And, um, and the set looks about the same as ours. I think they have better lighting. They had a lot more lights. Uh, we have good amount of lighting, to, but they like TV loves to fill up every square inch with lights in the ceiling. Uh, but other than that, I would argue our set's better. Um, and I think our graphics are better. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm pretty proud of, of where we gotten to. And now uh, we, you know, with all the skinny bundles, everybody says that's absolutely TV quality and ready to go. That's fantastic. And that, that's where the future, I think, is, is going to be, right? In the skinny bundles, in the OTT. It's, it's, it's funny, I was thinking about this the other day in that one of the, 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 the greatest jobs uh, in traditional TV was being the programmer, right? But now we're all our own programmers. We're picking and choosing from what we want. So as you start thinking about TYT going into those platforms, are you thinking about expanding the kinds of content that you're gonna cover? Is it just going deeper into what you've already been doing? To Deanna's point, we're really talk news and entertainment. So um, I, I care deeply about the news, so it's not quite a MacGuffin, uh, but really what we do is we build characters. And those characters can do a sh show around any topic. If you said to me, uh, create a talk show around chairs, uh, I guarantee you we can create the best talk show about <laughs> chairs there is, because we'll have an authentic, passionate uh, conversation about it. And if you give a damn about chairs, you'll watch that show and not the others, <laughs> partly because there are no others. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the idea is the same, which is, you know, be as honest as you can, be as passionate as you can about your topic. And you could really apply that all across talk. Deanna and Jenk, I want to leave a little time for Q&A, okay. if that's okay. But I, I have to ask one last question myself, because you, you know I love to, to pop the bubble of conventional wisdom. What was the thought process behind getting Dan Rather involved? And, and you know, I, it's, it, it, people of his stature are not who we normally think of when we think of online programming. Yeah, it was actually really easy because uh, one, he's been a wonderful, wonderful partner uh, and he wanted to do it. He really wanted to do it. Uh, he wants to reach a younger audience. Uh, and, and I said to him, look, s s sometimes, you know, if you read the comments, it could be choppy waters and mm -hmm. stuff. Are you sure you want to get back into this? And he said, can't wait. <laughs> he <laughs> said, if you're not getting that, then you're not relevant. And I came to you guys because you're relevant. And mm -hmm. so, and, he, and for us, he actually has a really strong Facebook presence. Uh, and, and his commentary, which was, in the, which was text, was already resonating. So I already knew that it was the right demos, it was the right mm -hmm. audience, and it was the right voice. And, and so marrying that to what we do today was, was really easy decision and easy execution. It certainly is, it was an interesting development, I think, in the history of online news to, to have somebody like that join. So are there any questions from the audience? We've got a few more minutes. Tracy. So from the OTT standpoint, the- We got a mic coming. 
Uh, from an OTT standpoint, the environment is so cluttered and there are so many other viewing opportunities for people. How do you plan to stand out in those platforms and, and what are you doing now to try and stand out where you are presently? Uh, by being awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness, uh, we've been number one on a lot of those OTT platforms and I'd like to say it's because of me. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it's, we have a huge advantage. Uh, news is popping on all those platforms. And the skinny bundles are not that cluttered. There's not that many channels on there, about four dozen, right? And that's it. That's way less cluttered than TV. Yeah. So if you're looking for, you know, a, a relatively large audience with not that many choices, right? Uh, in essence, it's almost like going back to the old days of TV. And there, I think that we're going to stand out significantly because we're in news and, and a lot of our programming is live. So I think that's gonna be a, a monumental advantage. Yeah, I would add to that. The um, first and foremost, um, for what we're being told, we're one of two or three digital native companies on these platforms. So they're, they're, they're bringing a lot of their broadcast and their cable partners over to some of these bundles. But from a digital native perspective, we're of the top two or three candidates for that. So it's actually a new environment. The second reason they're coming to us, which I think is obviously very relevant here too, is they're all in a, a foot race to market their services over the other guys, right? So there's a half dozen or a dozen. So when they think about unique programming that's unduplicated audience wise, that is at scale, those are the three reasons, right? TYT has the largest unduplicated audience for young adults in talk, news, and entertainment, hands down, right? And so they are marketing to these audiences, the cord cutters, the cord nevers, and they're like, what brands are going to resonate to get these people to buy? Because they can get NBC News, they can get CNN 80 places. They can get the Young Turks a handful of places, but more concentrated. And when they think, okay, what are these audiences prototypically looking for? They, they've actually, many of them approached us. So it's really that, that really unduplicated, young, concentrated audience and that digital native brand, let alone how awesome he is. <laughs> no, I had to say that, he, I report to him in case, right. in case haven't people haven't figured that out yet. Uh, it, seriously though, um, uh, I, whenever I run into people in the streets or we do a meet and greet, I always use them as a focus group. Um, uh, lack of resources for a long time. <laughs> so that's why they're my informal focus group. And uh, I always ask them two questions. Uh, where did you first see us and why do you watch us? Uh, and the answer to the second question is the most common answer is, is mixed. Uh, so the, the answer is what else would I watch? And so it's mixed in that it's not like you're awesome and I love, you know, and plenty of people say that and et cetera, but, uh, but it's because, but if you think about it, that's actually amazing for us because in terms of a live news talk show for this generation, what else is there to watch? They don't watch cable news at all. They don't watch local news at all. So if you're going online to watch a daily news program, name it. There isn't one, it's just us. And so that's why when we're making deals, it's way easier to make the deals because if you want that engaged audience that cares about this topic or, or all the topics that we cover, you gotta have us. Yes. Hi, from a brand partnerships perspective, you mentioned the bank. What brand categories have really worked with you guys so far? And what brand categories would you like to see more of for, you know, for whatever reason? Sure. Um, so finance has actually been a decent category. We had American Express. We had Aspiration Bank. We had a, a smaller community bank once. Um, and, uh, and then a lot of the folks that you normally see doing online uh, advertising like Squarespace and Crunchyroll and Naturebox and, and those guys. Um, we're really building out our sales team right now. I mean, Deanna came in and, and, uh, and hired folks within the last couple of months. Uh, so we were just kind of getting incoming calls and, and American Express came to us and wanted to put their documentary on our channel. And we're like, oh, sure, that sounds good. 
uh, and we did and got 12 million views and they were really happy and we were really happy. So we had some really great successes. Oh, Procter and Gamble. Um, and, and we did a really nice series for that for SK two, which is a uh, woman's cream. Um, and, and so that's what we did in terms of what we would like to do. I actually like selling. Uh, so if, if they're the brands that I love and believe in, I just let me add them. Uh, and they range from things that are logical and make sense. Like Aspiration is a very progressive bank that really looks out for their customers, et cetera. I love that and I could pitch that easy uh, to things you might not suspect. Uh, like, I, well, you might suspect that I love to eat. Um, but, you know, let me add Jersey Mike's, Popeye's. Uh, Jersey Mike's. Right. <laughs> I hop. Both Jersey guys. That's yeah. <laughs> I, on the show, we used to say whenever it was, uh, we had good news, and there was an IHOP around the corner, and we'd say, it's IHOP time, right? And they never paid us for it, so we stopped saying it. <laughs> <laughs> but they really should, because it was catchy, and people would then email in. Back then, it was mainly email, like, oh, I got a raise. It was IHOP time and stuff. <laughs> uh, and then random stuff like, I love my Nissan Altima. I think it's the perfect car. Okay, so... I'd, I'd love for them to give me a chance to talk about it. But if it turns out it's Honda, I bet that's pretty good too. Uh, <laughs> I would, um, just to add that I think, you know, categories that we're excited about, obviously are products that Jank's excited about, but we have 12 to 15 Jank's behind him that yep. are all passionate about different things. The, the areas that make sense to me are as much the topical categories, the products and services that resonate with these, uh, this generation or two. But I'd also say, think about challenger brands as well as leading brands. And what I'm, that sounds like I'm talking out of both sides, but heck, I'm in sales, so, uh, so <laughs> be it. But the challenger brands are like, they're willing to do something different. And that's, how we, that's why we're authentic to our audience, right? If we wanted to create polished hosts who read teleprompters and talked to the news, that would be something else. Well, we insert brand here, right? But we like the notion that we challenge the news, we challenge pop culture, we challenge the, the status quo. And so challenger brands have that in their DNA. And so we, it, it's the category of things where, oh, it works for us, it will work for XYZ brands. So if you think about almost the psychographic of the brand, the leading brands, I sort of think they're missing one, if not two generations, right? Because they're not marketing the way those challenger brands are. So I have very real conversations with them. They close the door and they say, what am I going to do? My, my audience is growing old. I'm losing them by, you know, the, the, the tens of millions. And, I, and typically I've been at, suggest say, hey, let's try something different. Um, let's bring in a new voice. Uh, my background is as much content marketing and branded content as it is traditional media. And I would say, well, if your brand had a voice, what kind of dinner party would it throw? How would it talk to its guests? How would it engage their guests? That conversation creatively is a lot of fun to have when you have a property and a series of properties where the host is open to engaging in that proverbial dinner party. So many cases, and I've just hired a head of branded content, uh, Drea, raise your hand, Bernardi. Um, invite us to the back rooms and let's sit down and let's figure it out because we can help brands resonate with audiences. We also can help challenger brands. We can give them the platform and let them run, right? And so I think it's as much categorically, sure, film, we've got a huge pop recently. A lot of film television brands are coming on hard because they see how we resonate. Technology, telecom coming hard at us because again, they've got to differentiate themselves. Surprise, surprise, 20 somethings don't care about 5G. So how are they gonna make that interesting, right? Financial services, he mentioned. Um, automotive to some extent, primarily because they've got big budgets and they're gonna spend on online video. Um, packaged goods, eh, a little bit. But I'm also as excited about travel and even what I'll call destination type accounts, right? And so there's, there's a lot of excitement. I think it's brand leadership and how the brand thinks about themselves. 
And if they're leaders or want to be leaders, they're talking to us. If they think of themselves as wanting to regain a position or continue to maintain a position, they're talking to us. Yeah, two, two quick things to that. Uh, we d recently did a deal with participant media uh, around the inconvenient sequel about climate change, Al Gore's movie. And we even won an award for that. And, and it's because it's a layup. Our audience cares about it. Uh, and, and we have real conversations around it. Instead of like, go see the movie, it's awesome. Like we talk about, hey, the real issues and challenges, et cetera. Uh, I did it, the most successful video in that series was one that the advertiser did not ask for. Uh, I did all the things that they asked and I said, hold on, I'm gonna do one more um, about how I didn't believe in climate change when I was younger uh, and what swung me and why I believe in it now and what I got out of the movie. And that one did gangbusters. Uh, so there's a, and look, we, we're disruptors and we built our brand online. So Google uh, used to do this thing called Creative Academy. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but they bring in the top brands in the world and teach them how to do the internet. And we would be Tuesday. <laughs> the young tourists would come in and teach them YouTube. Why? Because they want to build a brand on YouTube, you know, in the Google context. And we built a brand on YouTube. <laughs> And so we've done this before and we could really walk you through on how to resonate with that audience. I think we have time for one more. I know you have, uh, you have some things to get to this evening. Can we do one last question before we break? Maybe not. Yes, in the back. Hi, you guys, this is David Dowd from Tubular. So thanks both for your business and thanks for the invitation here. Um, so we look at data, you guys use data a lot. Um, you know, we see a lot in the news category, how we call it the Trump bump, you know, all the, all the news organizations benefited from Trump. And now we're seeing that really start to sort of, you know, become not so great. You know, it's, it's pretty saturated. So when you think of the news category, I know you guys have a unique take on this because your audiences don't, you know, go for, cable news and local news. Where do you see the, the topics that are really gonna resonate in the next you know, year or two that you're really gonna be able to increase the, the influence of your brand in speaking to this unique audience? Yeah, so I don't want people to overfocus on this because again, we're way broader than just politics. Um, and so stuff pops all the time in a great crossover is Kanye. Mm -hmm. yeah, man, I mean, and that's the thing about news, it never ends. <laughs> New is in the title. Uh, so Kanye videos are popping, of course, because he's insane. And <laughs> I, I was the first one to, that's not, not remotely true, that was Trumpian. I was not the first one, but I was among the leading people to say, no, this guy is really dumb, right? <laughs> like that whole musical genius thing, I don't know what you guys are talking about. He is really, really unintelligent. Um, <laughs> And now... Is this I, being streamed? It is, right? Okay, <laughs> can, someone, can someone get him uh, out of the building uh, before Kanye's people show up? Yeah. Um, and now Twitter's come around <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you were right. He's crazy. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but to answer your question directly, the political wars are coming. And so I don't think people on TV have a good sense of it because they have no sense of the left. So they know what they have on the right. They've got Trump, they got the establishment, and they got the establishment uh, Democrats. But there's a whole left that is rising up on the internet. And their main criticism of us is that we're too mainstream. Uh, and so the socialists are there, the communists are there, the pitchforks are there. And so there's going to be a gigantic four-way clash. And, that, and it is going to be all out war and one person left standing in 2020, and on one side left standing. That battle royale is going to be unlike anything you have ever seen. So we've yet begun to engage in that. So that begins uh, basically January 1st, 2019, because that's when all the people start running for president, and then all sides get in the middle of the ring, and it's gonna be a free for all. And I guarantee you views go way up. I'm gonna counter program here for a second and tell you what's also playing on the rest of the network, which is we're seeing some really important human issues play out nicely, right? 
um, it's not Me Too, but it is about the new form of feminism, right? Women rising and, and, and finding their voice and really being about helping other women out, but also helping other diverse audiences out. And so inclusion and, and telling those real people's stories, Anna Kasparian does a great job of that, um, sitting next to Jank, but then we have three or four other hosts that to be announced shows that are coming online that are really going to, to bring that story to, to roost, to bear. Um, on the other hand, the pop culture and entertainment side is fascinating because when you're watching not just, um, you know, the sort of the death of the rom-com, but you're seeing the advent of the superhero. Um, that's not new to anybody in this room, but it's, it's the way they're thinking about, um, you know, character development and it's such, and in the entertainment business, superhero, whatever, superpowers, and, and watching that play out across the stories. I've seen some of the slate for the holiday season and even next year and with the What the Flick crowd and they'll go, and, and then what we're seeing in the Netflix and Amazons and the streaming popular, the original series coming out, the entertainment industry needs navigation, but there are really some wonderful stories that are coming out and they love to talk about it. Game of Thrones will be back on air 2019, so we will have another big win there. Um, and then I, what I also like is um, sort of the, the, the social justice and the things that are happening globally that this audience only gets through unique voices on the internet. Um, and so these global stories that these common themes that we have globally, one of which is climate um, on sort of the challenging side, but on the opportunistic side, people are actually starting to help each other out, right? And whether that's at a global level, a country level, and, and so, so there's a, some, a real human element coming to life. And uh, as I said, I'm gonna keep plugging the happiest half hour, which is a great show we do on Fridays coming in about a month. Um, and that's because we all love a, a nice shot in the arm of positive news. And so you'll see that come to bear. Um, one last thought, we're doing a lot of audio too. So while we've talked a lot about online video, we, we like to surround our young Turks with access to the hosts, the talent, the stories across platforms and across media types. So we've got a really nice, robust podcasting. Uh, and actually, we're soon to be on the voice platforms too. So you'll see that from us in the next 30 to 60 days. Terrific. I can't wait to see the happiest half hour. I'm telling that you. Sounds, that sounds awesome. I'll send you, I'll send you the tape. Send you the <laughs> so, sizzle. So for now, thanks to the Young Turks, you're all invited to our happy half hour or hour, however long you want to stay. Um, thank you very much, Cenk. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Deanna. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I know some of the uh, Young Turks have to run off, I think, to do some other things. But uh, if some of the team wants to stay, we'll mingle for a little bit, have some drinks. And uh, thanks again for coming out. Great.